And we're back at the bench. Good. The gardening project's finally come to a finish. I can get back to doing something. But before we do, I'm going to have to clear all this crap away that has accumulated in my workspace over the last couple of months. And what a difference an hour and a half of tidying can accomplish. Let's finish off by wiping the board down with some white spirit, get all the dust and muck off, before we start building something new. I know I've got some unfinished projects to finish, but my mojo's gone a little bit on a few bits and pieces, so I just want something to get me back into it, and then we'll go straight back to them. So today we'll look at another Parkside by Pico model, and that'll be the 13 ton wooden goods wagon with corrugated steel ends and high bar. And for some variation, we'll do some mods on it. And with the help of the uh, PA16 chassis kit. And as usual, we've got our double-sided A4 instruction sheet. That's got text-based instructions and a single exploded diagram. Along with the instructions, we get some plastic parts that should make a reasonable representation of a diagram 1 slash 039 13 ton high bar wagon. Being a relatively small and simple wagon this shouldn't be too taxing and quite easy to get our mojo back. So there's about four sprues and about 20 different parts along with the supplied wheel sets, uh, brass bearings and a decal sheet that's produced by Model Master. We'll start by removing the sides and the end to create the sort of box shape of the wagon using a large flat file to clean up the edges of the floor and then the side of the knife to clean up the edges of the sides. As I say, I'm going to use the side of the knife to clean up the edges of the sides, the wooden sides, because imagine the that's the part of the body that's going to get clobbered by all sorts of chains and lifting equipment, commodities, and it's going to get hammered and bent out of all proportion. That's why the top bar of any wooden wagon is the most likely to be replaced. So. Although it's not, you can't see it in the, such a small scale, double O, the bigger scales you can really go to town on this sort of thing. A little bit of liquid poly applied to the edge that we've just manufactured will clean up all the dust and uh, stray edges into a clean thing that we can work with later when we come to paint. Like some of the mineral wagons that I've done previously the sides of this wagon go together really very well and I still won't use a jig or a clamp I prefer to hold it in my fingers glue it up all four sides and then the glue should be supple enough to bend into the right shape once we put the floor in batch building again so we need to make sure that we create the same angle with the same pieces just in case we end up with one that's the wrong way round when we come to the last one. The four corners now glued to each other we can now drop the floor in and cement that in place too. Making sure of course that the floor is pushed all the way down and sits on the correct part of the sole bar. Once I'd put the floor in I then left it overnight for the glue to completely cure before tackling the next bit which is attaching the sole bars and the wheels. Now when it comes to the sole bars and the wheels I probably do this different in every video but that's because there's not one way of doing it. To coin a phrase there's more than one way of skinning a cat. Only minimal cleanup required to get the brass bearing cups in on this kit. On this one I took the option of packing out the sole bar to get them to sit at 90 degrees when the wheels were inserted. 
Once everything was square, we glued everything in place. And then we can put it on our flat surface to make sure all the wheels are in line and square, flat. Any shadow that doesn't touch the wheel means that there's a discrepancy that needs addressing. Next up is the brake gear and I'll endeavour to get this set the correct way round after it was pointed out to me that I'd put some on the wrong way round. It took me hours to work out how that's possible but I did so now uh, hopefully it's right. Now the brake gear is possibly the only difference between the two versions that I'm doing here today and that's this set that is out of the box uh, which is four shoes inside the wheelbase and they push against the wheels and the uh, tie bar that you can see holding the axle boxes together is what they push against against to create the brake force. Now with parts from our PA16 chassis kit we can get the other version which is clasp brakes which is four four brake shoes per wheel and they grip the wheel as in clasping them that's the difference push and clasp and these ones don't need the tie bar because they don't need something to push against to create the brake force and the reason why I cut that piece in half was because a I'm not using the wheels that were supplied in the kit and because they're a part that's not part of this kit so it's easier to split them to get it on again this is one of the areas where we can eliminate some of the potential running anomalies making sure that the brake blocks aren't quite touching the wheel and then just giving it a simple roll test before we head to paint it's time to before we head to paint it's time to add the small details handbrake levers buffers couplings door bangers and the tarpaulin support rail or high bar on the face of it when I started doing the history for these wagons I thought it was going to be quite straightforward but it turns out to be quite complex but don't take my word for it the Bible says so there were 5,650 of these wagons built from the early to mid 1950s. We've already discussed the uh, different brake arrangements and axle boxes. There's probably other differences that I haven't even noticed. And then when you add in the maintenance and repairs, that would have added even more differences, mostly to wheel sets, buffers and axle boxes. I think the most confusing thing about the story on these wagons is the fact that they were all built with high bars, what I'm putting on now, and then in later years some had the high bar removed. Coupled with the fact that there were other wagons built at the same time but without the high bar and then in later years had the high bar fitted <laughs> It makes no sense whatsoever, but then if you've worked on the railway or had any dealings with it, you'll know that that is not an uncommon situation. <laughs> For that confusing state of affairs, the easiest way to work out what type of wagon this is, is to look at the number and then reference it against how it was originally built. So with construction complete, a nice dip in some warm soapy water to get everything nice and clean then off to the paint booth and the footage that I shot initially for this was awful so this is a shot of them primed up and ready for top coating and it shows the obligatory not black on the under frames and upper body metalwork and then light grey for the woodwork on the inside and the outside and that's just a base undercoats. Now I know that painting is probably my biggest weakness when it comes to modelling but in an attempt to omit the need for masking 
I've bought a new airbrush and we'll see how it goes. And it looks like, at least, I've got the lighting right this time. Trying not to drown out our pre-shading. Yes, I'm subscribed to Uncle Night Shift and not applying very much paint to the metalwork on the upper bodywork. And what little overspray that I did get on the underframe can be rectified when we do uh, weathering. I'm building three wagons and by the time I'd finished painting the third one, I then applied the second coat to the first one. And that's it for main painting. The rest of it can be done with washes and detail painting with a brush. Now about a hundred or so of these wagons were converted for strip coil traffic in the late 1960s. And that's the version that I'm doing. Now to get the cradles or bulks for the, the steel coils, I had to resort to looking at another type of wagon. And I can't imagine that the way that they're constructed out of wood is any different from the wagon that I'm doing. So it's evergreen styrene stripped to the fore again. Studying the pictures that are available for reference, it looks like the uh, longitudinal bars that the, wagon, uh, that the coil sit on has the inside edge chamfered off, a little triangle. And that's supposedly so the coil, when it sits on that chamfered edge, rests on the floor as well. Playing around with the measurements and cutting the pieces to size, it only took five minutes to construct this cradle thing that holds the coils. The whole process is shown here radically sped up. Again, going back to the pictures for reference, it looks like there's three bays for three coils. Uh, I wouldn't imagine that the wagon would be strong enough to hold three coils, but I suspect they were spaced so you'd get two, two, one at each end, or a single in the middle. Along with my mediocre painting skills, I have the other issue when it comes to this sort of thing is colour, which I'm not particularly good at either. I'm not saying I'm colour blind, more like colour uncoordinated. So this is me making stuff up again, beige and grey to make a sort of wood colour. And in my mixing pot on top of a piece of plywood, it doesn't seem to be that far out. Once painted, I'll just check it against another normal piece of wood and it looks sort of, yeah, I can go with that. It just needed a little bit of finishing off, so a, a, a sort of light brown wash is good enough. Well, it is for me anyway. In other reference photos that I've seen of metal being held or transported on wooden cradles, there always seems to be a transfer of the metal sheen that the metal has onto the wood where it's being carried. And I think the best way of the best way of portraying that is with the edge of, edge of a pencil and then rubbed lightly with your finger or a cotton bud. There'll also be other weathering effects that we'll do when we do the wagon, which we'll go back to now. After applying the transfers, which were mainly Fox and a few of the ones supplied in the kit, I had a virtual disaster because when I went to seal the transfers in with a matte varnish, my matte varnish has been contaminated with a little bit of white paint, which nearly cancelled the whole project. <laughs> a couple of hours with some thinners and a thin paintbrush trying to scrape it all out did the trick most of the time. To help that process along, I made my own wash out of some artist oil and some thinners. If I was making wagons dedicated to soda ash or china clay, my mistake with the white paint in the matte varnish wouldn't have mattered. But I'm not, so it did. I got most of it off and then I used the wash as a filter to see if I could get the rest of it off. I wouldn't know for sure 
until it had dried completely. I applied the same wash on the inside of the wagon and then let it dry for 10-15 minutes and then come in with a damp cotton bud wipe off the excess. Once the washes were dry it turned out that it didn't look too bad at all and I may well have got away with this one. And then I secured the cradles in with a drop of glue and then continued to add more layers of weathering with some powders. I think I used track rust and medium rust which is my two favourite colours of weathering powder. That was applied to the underframe and the metalwork on the upper body. And for the insides I used metal slag. I find it's about this point where some might say oh you've gone too far with the weathering or others might say you haven't gone far enough. Luckily art, which this is a form of, is subjective and therefore open to interpretation by each individual. Once the weathering powders were fixed into place I then went back over some minor details like uh, bolts and panel lines with a really thin uh, pin wash. A process that I think is a bit worrying because you can't really tell what it's going to look like until it's fully dried. There's probably more that could be done but for me that's it. It's enough. All that's left to do is build some loads to go in it, some steel coils. I did a video on that which is linked above here in the top corner. Alternately I recently discovered a company that's manufacturing this sort of thing commercially and that's Goodwood Scenics linked in the description below along with a multitude of other information. I've really enjoyed doing this little project and hopefully it's given me my mojo back enough to finish off the last two projects that are still uh, waiting on the bench to be finished off and the videos to be produced as well. Oh, I nearly forgot uh, before I added the wheels and the couplings I filled the underneath channels with as much lead as I could possibly fit in just to give the wagon a little bit of weight. I've referenced this in a few other videos so it's about that time to put them into revenue earning service. That's code for into storage until I get the layout to a stage where I can start running trains again. These wagons lasted until the 9th. These wagons lasted until the end of the 1970s when they were replaced by more modern types, something we'll look at in a future episode. In the meantime, thanks for watching. See you again soon.